Thanks, Neeraj. Uh, so we're here at the CLS Invest uh, Conference from Gurgaon, and joining me right now is Christopher Wood, a global equity strategist at CLSA. Chris, thanks very much for taking out the time and speaking mm -hmm. with us. Uh, let's start off first with the CLSA house view on the equity markets, particularly emerging equity markets, and then your look, outlook on India. Right. Well, my, my view in all markets is that the obvious risk is U.S. monetary tightening. The way I look at it, we've had a rolling correction, began with the cryptocurrencies, the most high beta asset class, rolled into emerging markets, Europe, Japan. At the end of last quarter, the U.S. was the last man standing. U.S. equities clearly corrected in October. The way here at this point now, I think there's a good chance of a rally on a, if we get this U.S.-China trade deal, which is my base case at the G20 summit or around about that time. So we, if such a deal happens, that should be a love counter trend rally, probably led by Asian equities. But at that point, we would, will then have to stop and realize we still have ongoing U.S. monetary tightening. Mm. So I don't think we're out of the risk aversion phase yet. What I'm hoping is that Asia, under, Asia and emerging markets under performance relative to the rest of the world has bottomed out. Yeah, yeah. So do you see a significant turnaround post this correction? Because China is still in a bear market. We've been seeing a lot of pressure building up in Hong Kong and Indian markets have corrected almost 15%. Uh, so the recovery also has been uh, good enough. Right. Well, in the case of China, personally, I think China's equities are extremely cheap. Um, I think a lot of the weakness in China equities is self-induced by government deleveraging. The, the Trump administration thinks the weakness in the Chinese stock market is driven by the trade dispute, but it's not. It's driven by the squeeze on shadow banking. I think there's been a lot of forced selling in China equities this year for various technical factors. And I believe basically yeah, Chinese equities are very, in, are very attractive at this point. <coughs> the, the risk in China the next few quarters is weakening in the property market. But the Chinese have a lot of policies they could implement if they wanted to stimulate. So personally, I would be, China's a market I would be buying today if I'm an emerging Asian portfolio manager. India, I think, is going to provide a buying opportunity, but I wouldn't be rushing to buy India like right now today. I think the buying opportunity is going to come more likely after the state elections first quarter. Mm -hmm. If the BJP does not do well in these current state elections you're having, then, which is a distinct possibility because people often vote anti-incumbent, yeah. then you will get a lot of noise that uh, Mr. Modi won't be re-elected and that the re domestic investors here will get more nervous. I think that will create a good buying opportunity for foreigners yeah. because in my view the Modi, the Modi government will be re-elected with a diminished majority but I, don't, but I believe there's a lot of room for people to worry that it won't. So is that the only reason that's keeping foreign investors away, waiting to know the result of the election? No, no, I'm not sure. The, no, I don't think the foreigners are obsessed on the politics as the locals. Yeah. But I, no, I think what's unnerved the, uh, the foreigners is, uh, is what's just happened, in the, uh, and happened a, a month or two ago in the, uh, in the credit space yeah. where you've had a triple A rated bond default, which yeah. clearly uh, has caused a big concern. And clearly, the, in the whole housing, uh, non-bank financial space, you're going to have a significant slowdown. But based on my very superficial um, observation from initial meetings this week, I'm hoping, with the emphasis on the word hope, that the worst yeah. has been seen in this area. Mm -hmm. But going forward, there's going to be a material slowdown. Right. But uh, would you paint all the NBFCs with the same brush? I mean, there are no, no. But the, but the bottom line is, if you have a triple A rated bond default, then it's going to make the, the market effect, nervous. Yeah. So what it's going to mean in reality is that bond investors are going to invest first and foremost on the names of the parentage, because they're no longer going to believe the credit ratings. True. So that's a you know that's a big problem. Yeah because not everybody is a subsidiary of a long-established parent. Mm. You, you have uh, you know, a significant chunk in your model portfolio for NBFCs in, in the and the financial space as a whole. Are, are you tweaking around? One, well, I, I, if I was running, yeah, so this portfolio, see, this, this portfolio is a good example because I, this portfolio was outperforming the Asian benchmark quite significantly until uh, the events happened, which I believe was late August. Yes, yeah, and so this portfolio got smashed in the month of September because I've always had actually 
since I began this portfolio, which is a long time ago, 2002, mm -hmm. probably the biggest waiting for the whole period has been Indian financials. Yeah. So, so I know I'm not panicking out, but the but the point is, it's a it's a big. It'll hit. be a slow and gradual recovery. Yes, because this, without any doubt whatsoever, the uh, rate of growth is going to slow in this area. Long term, I think this represents a huge opportunity, particularly in the property space because in my view the residential property sector in India was already, at all, was already facing what I call a double whammy. Mm -hmm. The double whammy was first demonetization, yeah. the second was the introduction of the real estate regulation at RERA, which I think is a very, uh, very good piece of legislation, but clearly it's going to cause consolidation. So we're already looking at a brutal consolidation. We're now getting a triple whammy because clearly liquidity. liquidity because these housing finance companies are finance developers. Yeah. So there's a triple whammy. So what people want to be, need to be doing is working out who are the well capitalized property developers who are going to benefit from what's going to be absolutely brutal consolidation. But that, that, that means that they now need to focus more on getting rid of their inventory and start selling a little bit more instead of just, you know, holding on for liquidity in terms of bank credit or any no, other No, no, sure, but this consolidation was already happening. Yeah. It's just going to become more dramatic. But I th in my view, you want to own the quality property companies who are going to benefit from the consolidation. Meanwhile, amidst the bearish sentiment, we need to remember that the affordable housing build out is still, go, is still going on. The affordable housing program is um, uh, underway and that's very, uh, very positive. And uh, you want to own stocks benefiting this area. Uh, the other good news for India short term is oil coming down. Yeah, yeah. Actually though, on a one year view, my biggest concern on India is oil because I still think there's a lot of potential for oil to go up. So I think the oil correction you've seen of late is simply driven by the news flow in Iran. Yeah, and OPEC saying that the, the demand for their own crude is coming off on the backdrop of the economic slowdown. Yes, I'm not quite sure where OPEC is getting that from. Yeah. <laughs> but to me, the, the, the key variable is we've gone in a space of two months from the world assuming that the Americans are going to put sanctions on anybody bought any Iran oil whatsoever to the Americans doing almost 100% U-turn and making these significant exemptions. So I personally think that's the key reason for the round trip in oil. So in your view, the long term, uh, uh, you do see uh, crude oil going higher? I think there's a material risk of oil goes significantly higher, so the Indian government should be aware of that risk and that it certainly be very, very dangerous to assume that oil has peaked here because the fact is there's very little evidence so far statistically of demand for oil slowing. I know these are just forecasts. Yeah. And the reason demand for oil keeps exceeding the, the IEA forecast is because of demand in emerging markets. Actually India is a good, is, a, is actually about to get to a level of GDP per capita China was back in 2001 mm -hmm. when oil demand exploded on the upside in China. So the excitement around uh, uh, crude oil coming off and then the positive implications for CAD may be short-lived, is that what you're saying? Yeah, I'm, well I'm, I'm saying the key thing is a big relief that yeah. this Iranian sanctions were not enforced. Otherwise I think oil could be way higher. Yeah. Yeah. What's your target for uh, crude oil? No, my, I, I'm not an oil analyst. All I'm, well, the reason I'm highlighting this is because demand remains strong mm -hmm. and <clears throat> the supply of, from conventional oil industry has not, is not increasing. There's been hardly any investment by the conventional oil industry for the last few years because of this whole alternative energy movement. So the key variable is how much U.S. shale production can increase. All right. Uh, is, is the markets now looking at liquidity uh, being a crucial aspect in the U.S. as well, because U.S. so far has not been in a phase where they've not had access to cheap and easy, easy money. Now, as we take a turn around the corner where there's a pullback of QE, mm -hmm. you're going to see the eff effects of... Uh, no, absolutely. So basically, you've got a double whammy of monetary tightening going on in the U.S. You've got... Um, obviously Fed rate hikes, but you've also got accelerating Fed balance sheet contraction. So that's just plain negative for risk assets. And you're going to have, as we go into 2019, the huge stimulus effect of tax reform start to come out of the numbers. But 
I think the tax reform has been hugely positive for the US stock market this year and explains why it took until October for monetary tightening to hit the US because the, the, the first of all this higher cuts in taxes was a big boost to corporate earnings but second is the repatriation of American corporate money offshore which was basically incentivized by the tax reform which has led to a renewed explosion in share buybacks mm -hmm. so the first two quarters of this year saw record high share buybacks and that's the single biggest reason why the US stock market has outperformed what is the bearing of that for a market like India well the, so that's a, actually the money going back mm -hmm. into America has been a negative for emerging markets because it's created a bit of an offshore dollar funding squeeze so the key driver of relative returns this year in world markets is not economic growth, it's U.S. tax reform. U.S. tax reform has been bullish for U.S. stocks and bearish for the rest of the world because the money has gone back into America. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, when we're talking about liquidity, uh, it is a term which makes headlines uh, you know, on an almost a daily basis for our markets as well. The RBI has been doing its fair bit to make sure the sy systemic liquidity stays. You know, are you happy with the proactiveness of the RBI? Uh, well, I'm not here, so I, well, I, apparently some measures have been taken. I'm not sure the government. Uh, I'm not sure the government is complete, completely happy with the RBI. But I would say, in terms of this uh, current uh, noise, uh, media the noise about the, the dispute with the RBI and the government, personally, I'm more sympathetic to the government than some commentators because the reality is the central bank has been running a pretty tight monetary policy in India in recent years. Because of my understanding is the central bank has an inflation targeting policy and they're targeting headline inflation. So if that's the policy, they're running very high real interest rates relative to headline inflation. So that I think is why they are vulnerable to criticism, because it looks like headline inflation has come down significantly in India, partly because of cheaper food prices, which I am told, I'm not an expert, reflects in productivity improvements in Indian agriculture. Sure, but which is why they held interest rates the last time around, and they're yeah, probably it, most likely to do so this time around as well. Yeah, but you could argue that rates should be could be materially lower in India. <coughs> now, if you're they're running monetary policy around concerns on the currency, then that would justify potentially having higher rates. But all I'm saying is there's a legitimate argument that monetary policy is being too tight, most particularly given that credit growth is weak and you have this legacy problem in the banking sector. Mm -hmm. So personally, I think monetary policy has been too tight. I think this argument of you know the central bank being overcapitalized has some legitimacy, and I think Indian any time you can buy the Indian ten-year government bond at eight percent yield, which you couldn't until a few weeks ago, is good value. So I think at eight percent, foreigners will come back and buy Indian bonds. So to me, the big risk in India right now, from a bond currency point of view actually is external and outside the control of the Indian government. That's what we were talking about earlier. Mm -hmm. The oil price, one is the oil price and two, how much more the Fed tightens. Yeah, uh, sure. So uh, the recent fine print on, uh, on the FII interest in the bond market has been slightly more uh, positive. You've been seeing some buying coming back into the bond market. Do you see that likely continue? I you think, it, I think if the US Treasury yields peak here, definitely. But personally, I would be a buyer of Indian tenure at 8%. Okay. That to me is good value. And I think the cent because, precisely because the RBI has been running a tight monetary policy, it makes Indian government bonds attractive. At this juncture, uh, would the strategy be to probably uh, sit on cash a bit or deploy more in the equity markets? No, I would be looking to buy, but first of all, I would be buying bonds around 8%. So any uh, Over equities. Yeah, now, no, but I think if I was, didn't own any Indian equities yet, I personally would be waiting for the state election results and this commercial paper to be rolled. Okay. Because first of all, I want to see the commercial paper rolled. Um, everybody tells me it's going to be rolled okay, but you yeah. know, I'd rather just see it happen. <laughs> and then the second point, I might as well wait for these elections because, the, if, yeah, because there's obviously got to be a chance that the BJP doesn't do so well because there's always a bit of an anti-incumbency sentiment in these elections and that could trigger some nervousness and then I personally would view that as an opportunity to, to buy. 
how does all this volatility, according to you, play out for the currency and uh, the impression that that creates externally? Because obviously, uh, with the currency weakening the way it is, the returns for foreign investors. Uh, yeah, but see, the currency weakened, having weakened so much to me is now a positive. If I'm looking to invest, that to me is a reason for foreign to invest. <laughs> because I don't think the you know I don't think the monetary policy is quite tight. I, to, to me, that's an opportunity, not a negative, as of today, because it's already weakened. So a fair value of 70 to 73 natural no, cost no, of the rupee. Yeah, but where if oil goes to triple digits, which yeah. if oil goes above 100, which in my view is not impossible, clearly Indian rupee can come lower. So if I own Indian domestic equities, which I want to own, like the financials in a portfolio, personally I want to also I want to hedge it with oil plays. With okay. stocks that benefit from higher oil, because I still think there's a material risk oil can go significantly higher. All right. What else, aside from financials, that holds a significant chunk in your portfolio? What well, else? No, is well, no. Well, I would definitely own. A, I have a. I, I would want to own the healthy real estate plays. And going forward next year, I think in the next few months is going to make sense to try and add to stock put more in a port Indian portfolio geared to uh, hope for the long-awaited capex pickup. Because I'm hoping that then by 2019, we begin to get evidence of CapEx picking up here. Obviously, people have been hoping this for several years. But to me, there's now a better chance this finally starts to happen. Most particularly if we see more cases successfully resolved in this uh, bankruptcy court. Right. You, you think this was a big, big positive that happened? What, what? The creation of the bankruptcy court? Well, no, I think it's a huge positive about bankruptcy legislation. But it's got to obviously be seen to work. Yeah. And it's become more complicated than it would otherwise be because this government, to its credit, is trying to ensure that former creditors don't buy their assets back on the cheap through the back door, mm -hmm. which is what normally happens in these situations in other countries. So they're, because they're trying to make that happen or ensure that, it means the process will take longer. But if they succeed in that aim, it will be extremely constructive. Mm -hmm. So Let's yeah, I think the bankruptcy legislation is one of the uh, major achievements of the uh, of the current government. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about valuations. Earlier on, I was talking to Mahesh, and he pointed out that our current valuations are still higher than what our Asian peers are trading at, mm -hmm. uh, considering a historical valuation. So he would rather be more comfortable if these valuations came off a little bit more. I know that's without doubt. The, Ind the Indian market is not cheap. <clears throat> but most particularly, as uh, there's a risk that some of this earnings forecasts have not discounted the uh, clear slowdown that's going to happen as a consequence of this credit crunch in the uh, non-bank bank space. So it's, it's, it's been uh, just a similar amount of time that we've started facing issues uh, with the credit crunch as we've seen this September quarter. So much of it probably will start reflecting for on, in the consecutive quarters to yeah. come. So do you see more earnings downgrades? No, now? I think no, I think there's a clear risk. But the, the stock market's already told you that. Yeah. So I've got no idea what the analysts have downgraded it, but it's quite clear that growth's going to slow. I mean, in this particular area. So, but the Indian market, look, never is, uh, the Indian market is certainly not cheap. If you're a value investor, there's much cheaper markets. You know, the Chinese stock market is dramatically cheaper than the Indian market right now, most particularly if you exclude internet names. Mm -hmm. It's on single digit PE. Right. But the idea is not, uh, is the idea solely to choose a market that's cheap or that has a significant uh, return on investment and the growth prospects seem higher. So yeah. even at a valuation which is slightly higher, because your growth prospects are there. Sure. So that's why I don't think India will get that cheap. Okay. So I view India and China as complementary in a portfolio because, uh, yes, I don't believe. Uh, but if you if you're a investor purely driven primarily by valuation criteria, you're never going to be overweight India. India has always been a market for growth investors, uh, and India doesn't have dividends. Mm. See, these Chinese stocks have much higher dividends. So for investors who are focused on dividends and income, India is never attractive. Right. Chris, before I wind up, um, I'm, I'm just trying my luck here. Anything in specific, a pocket that you really like investing in uh, within India? Maybe a fresh investment or probably adding a uh, no, if I was going to say to someone to make one investment for the next five years in India, the obvious thing to do is to take a view on which, uh, which companies are going to be the beneficiaries of what's going to be an absolutely dramatic consolidation 
in the uh, Indian uh, residential property sector for the triple, you know, the, because what was already looking like a dramatic consolidation based on what I described as a double whammy yeah. is now going to be a triple whammy. Yeah. So up until now, real estate was but written under, off. Mm -hmm. It was written off. I mean, there was not much happening in that space, but you're saying relook at it and have... Oh, no, I think you should already be positioned yeah. in the quality development. I'm just saying this has become an even better opportunity, but it's, it's a five-year view. It's not going to show yeah. up in three months. Got that. Yeah. Chris, thanks Thank a lot you. for Thank joining you. and appreciate you. you taking out the time and sharing those views with us.